move around real quick, but I'm going to go ahead and introduce our next speaker. So we're going to hear from Treya, and he's going to be talking about small high fetal biology control. Um, just a little bit about him real quick. Uh, he's a 10th grade student at Orlando Science High School in Orlando, Florida. And he's been involved in a lot of university level uh, laboratory academic research since the age of 12 and has won many, many regional, national, and international awards uh, throughout his time, as well as a lot of other awards in general. So, very accomplished young man. Um, so, he'll be speaking a little bit about the research he's performed on effective organic age for small high fetal treatment, and we'll be sharing a comprehensive review on the small. Beetle and its behavior and biology. So let's give a round of applause to Atreya. All right, while we're waiting for the walls to be taken down, the next session after this in this side of the room will be Michael Palmer. In that side of the room will be Randy Oliver. So the talk that he was going to give earlier will be on that side of the wall. This side of the wall will be Michael Palmer at two. Okay. But hopefully Atreo will be on. He's communicating with me. Hello? Hi, Drea. Hello. Can you hear us okay? Yes, I can hear you. Let's see if we can hear you. Can you unmute yourself and try talking? Sure. Are you not able to hear me? Try talking again. Okay. Are you able to hear me now? Keep talking. Let's see if that's loud okay. enough for everybody. Is this good? Can you guys hear? Louder. I'm going to turn you around so you can see everyone. Okay. I do have a PowerPoint uh, that I'm going to be sharing on the screen via screen share. Okay, you should be good to go. Okay, thank you. Yes, thanks. So I hope you all are able to see my screen. I have a PowerPoint pulled up. Can I get confirmation, please, uh, that you can see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay, thank you. So my name is Atreya Manasli. I'm a 10th grade student in Orlando, Florida at Orlando Science High School. And I'm affiliated with the University of Florida's Honeybee Research Laboratory and also the US Department of Agriculture. So I'm gonna be speaking you all to, uh, to you all today on small high beetle biology and control and sharing some of my research. So my backstory of how I really got into honeybees at a relatively young age is what I'd like to begin with. So four years ago, I went on a short fishing trip with a friend and his grandfather. And while we were on the boat, my friend's grandfather started talking about his beekeeping practices and he was telling us stories. I remember one specifically was about how decades ago he would get dozens of barrels of honey and how that season he'd gotten nearly three. 
So this was very, very shocking to me. And I remember the distinct tone of his voice and the tears in the corner of this almost 80 year old man's eyes. And at that moment, I knew there had to be something that I could do to try and help him. So I went back home and I dug into the statistics and the research and I did some brainstorming. Then I set foot into the University of Florida's laboratory in seventh grade at age 12. And that's when my quest really began. So that first year, which is what that picture is from in the laboratory, the laboratory is a very comfy and cozy environment, I'd like to say. And progressing into field trials in future years really showed me the difficulty of beekeeping and how hard it is to really work in the field and uh, how hard it is to put food onto our plates. So that really opened my eyes. Now, as per the presentation, I'll be speaking on two principal topics, the first of which will be the biology of the beetle. This will be focusing on the background of the beetle, morphological and behavioral characteristics. And then the second aspect of this study, will be of this PowerPoint, will be focusing on treatments. And this will be twofold. So the first will be chemical-based treatments, and the second will be organic-based agents. And organic treatments are what I actually did my research on, and that's what I'll be sharing. The takeaways I'd like you to have by the end of this presentation are firstly, what small hive beetles are. Secondly, what small hive beetles actually do inside your colonies. Thirdly, what I learned from my research. And then lastly, how you can actually implement my findings into your hobbyist or your commercial beekeeping practices. So let's begin. Beginning with the biology, Athena tamida is the scientific name for the small hive beetle. And the beetle was actually native to sub-Saharan Africa prior to the 1990s. However, in 1996, the first reports came from the Carolinas. And then in 1998, the first official report of a beetle infestation came from my home state, Florida. Since then, beetles have been spreading all across the globe, wreaking significant negative impacts on the beekeeping industry, particularly in the Southern Hemisphere and in the states, the Southern states, beetles have a lot more detriment because of the soil, the moisture in it specifically, so they tend to do better in moist environments and in higher humidities. So the beetle is described as an opportunistic scavenger in the literature, meaning that it is a smart predator of the honeybee. What these beetles do inside the hive is they actually destroy the honey and the pollen stores and they damage the cappings and the comb. And this ultimately stresses the bees. Now, the European honeybees, which are the bees that we manage in North America, are particularly susceptible to these small hive beetles. As I mentioned, this beetle was endemic to sub-Saharan Africa where the westernized or where the Africanized honeybee is located. So this Africanized bee is not as affected by this beetle and it's actually able to fend off against the beetle. If the beetle infestations become very bad in these African bee colonies, then these African bees will just abscond or leave entirely from their hives. Now, for the adult small hive beetles, you can actually sex them. And so I've done this quite a few times during my research to identify which is which. And you can do this in three ways. So there's three things will happen when you actually sex the beetle. What you do is, as you can see in this bottom right image, you take the abdomen of the beetle and then you press. And one of three things will happen. So the first of which is that a short appendage will shoot out. The second of which could be that a long appendage will shoot out. And the third thing that can happen is the beetle will simply explode because you press too hard. Now, assuming you didn't do one of the, uh, assuming you did one of the first two things, if you have a very long appendage that shoots out, that actually indicates that the beetle is a female. And so that isn't a phallus, but rather an ovipositor, that appendage. That ovipositor is used by this female to, uh, the female uses the ovipositor and sticks it in cracks and crevices within the hive. And so the beetle can access different regions where she can deposit her eggs in places that the bees can't get access to. So these eggs are safe. And so that makes it a very smart way to reproduce. Now, if something short shoots out, or as a rule of thumb, if nothing shoots out from the uh, back of the beetle, then it's generally a male. So these are the sexes. Now you can see other types of beetles that can show up inside your colonies, as you can see on these, uh, these two images on the left. So this is a sap beetle and a pollen beetle. Now, I say this to say that just because you have other things that show up in your hives, it doesn't necessarily mean that they are hive beetles and it's not a call for concern, but rather it's best to call your local bee inspector or compare these beetles against images of small hive beetles to see which one is which. Now, this image on the right is of a large hive beetle. So the large hive beetle is 20 to 23 millimeters in length, this specific species. 
But the large hive beetle in general does not refer to one singular species. Rather, each region has their own assortment of large hive beetles. And the small hive beetle gets its name because it's four to six millimeters in length. So it's almost a fifth or a sixth of the size of these large hive beetles. But the small hive beetle does refer to one singular species contrary to these large hive beetles. Now this is the life cycle of the small hive beetle. There are four primary stages. This first stage is the egg stage. After the eggs hatch in the colonies, they develop into larvae. And so these larvae tunnel through the colonies and they're really the root cause of all the damage, which I'll elaborate on in the next slide. But after these larvae have fed sufficiently inside the hive, they'll crawl out of the colony and then pupate inside the soil near the hive. So in the vicinity of the hive, they pupate. And then this is what a pupae looks like, this bottom right image. After three to six weeks, this pupae emerges as an adult beetle and in 24 to 48 hours, it develops this reddish brown hue. So something I'd like to outline here, something that's really neat here is in good conditions, this egg will take two days to hatch, the larvae takes seven days to develop fully, this pupa takes three weeks. So adding this up, it's roughly two plus seven days, which is a week plus this third week, which is four weeks. So four weeks from this egg stage to the end of this pupal stage, meaning mm -hmm. that that's how long it takes for the beetle to develop fully. Now, the lifespan of this beetle is 24 weeks, meaning that four times six is 24. So you can see up to six consecutive generations of beetles inside a hive if conditions are suitable in that environment, meaning that these beetle infestations can really get out of control if they are not managed. As I mentioned, the larvae are the root cause for damage. These larvae appear very suddenly and in large numbers, often in the hundreds or the thousands. So this image in the middle is what a very bad larval infestation looks like. Something interesting to note is that there is a feces associated with these larvae, specifically it's called Cotoma omeri, K. omeri. And so what this, uh, what this yeast strain does when it's uh, exposed to pollen or honey is it causes fermentation. And this is a very specific type of fermentation wherein a chemical compound known as isoamyl acetate is released. So when isoamyl acetate is released, and isoamyl acetate is also the honeybee alarm pheromone. So you might know where I'm going with this. When that isoamyl acetate is released from these yeasts inside the colony, it serves as a calling signal to beetles from outside the hive and tells them that there's a surplus of food in this, in this hive. Now, when this larval infestation is very bad, the brood rearing may cease entirely and the population begins to dwindle rapidly. And this event is termed as a slime out. Now there's two telltale signs of a very bad larval infestation. The first of which being a rotting citrus odor when you pop open a suit, uh, the lid on the super. And the second of which being that honey will actually begin to bleed out from the front of the colony as you can see in this image on the bottom right. Now, a very neat behavioral characteristic that's associated with this small hive beetle is something known as a jailing phenomenon. Now that's not an official terminology, but what happens here is essentially that these bees corner beetles into cracks and crevices within the hive and essentially jail them. So you have these guard bees that are pushing these beetles into different places in the hive and making sure they stay there. So that's very neat. But something even neater is that 10% of the time, you can see this in the bottom right, something will happen between the beetle and the bee. The beetle will take its antenna and actually antenate, so it'll start vibrating its antenna against the mandibles of the honeybee. And this will trick the honeybee into thinking that the beetle is actually a bee. So the honeybee will start regurgitating food and feeding the beetle. And so this only occurs about 10% of the time, the other 90% of the time, the bee is not tricked, but something interesting to note. So this predator is actually very smart inside the colony. Now, some good apiary practices for small hive beetle infestations in general are that when combining or exchanging comb, you must be careful because you can actually introduce small hive beetle eggs from outside the colony into a new colony. Another thing is that when removing old frames or hives or even adding uh, new frames or uh, new hives or new supers, you shouldn't use rotten, cracked or damaged comb, anything dilapidated 
that makes for good hiding spots for beetles. And in addition to this, these female beetles can also lay eggs inside any cracks and crevices within these frames or within these supers. So it's best to use uh, new frames and new supers. Now, when pulling honey from the colonies, it's important to extract quickly, as quick as possible, preferably within a two-day period, because the beetles will actually consume the wax cappings, and that will render that store entirely unsuitable for consumption. Another thing that you can do is expose your hives to sunlight. So when you do this, the hive beetles are actually repelled by this, and the bees do get a little bit aggravated, but they don't mind as much. The last thing is that when creating nucleus colonies or also when adding a lot of new frames or new supers to pre-existing colonies, it's important to only add as much as the bees can handle at that time. So if the colony is growing, it would be advisable to add a new super. But for particularly a weaker colony, adding a new super would just give the beetles more room to move around. And so they would be unpatrolled by the bees. So only adding as many frames or as many supers as the colony needs to grow. Now, moving on to the second segment of this presentation, the treatment aspect of this. So for chemical treatments, there's really two main agents that you have used, you may have used or heard about. The first of which is check mite. So this can be used for both varroa control and also hive beetles. The active ingredient in this is 10% comophos. The other agent here is guard star. So this has a 40% permethrin concentration. Permethrin is the chemical. Now, the comophos strips when check mite are applied in stages one and two during the uh, adult stage of the life cycle of the beetle and it's applied as a strip. So generally for high beetle treatment, the strips are stapled onto cardboard and then placed on top of fra uh, frames. Now the permethrin is added in stage five as a soil drench when the beetles pupate in the soil as we mentioned earlier. So when you drench the soil with permethrin, the beetles will die. Now for these organic and biological treatment agents, there are quite a few that can be used. Uh, one big one is attractants. So these can be used inside different traps that exist. One of these famous attractants is apple cider vinegar. So it's an odorous compound. And one I'll discuss, one of the traps that I'll discuss is the beetle blaster trap you may have heard of. So this is uh, the black and white trap you see here. So this has slits on the top of it. And essentially you can pour an attractant inside and uh, through these slits and then it'll be stored there. And then you place this trap in between frames in the colonies. So this attracts beetles from already inside the hive into that trap and drowns them in that solution. This is a baseboard trap that can also be used. This third image is diatomaceous earth. So diatomaceous earth is placed in the vicinity of the hive, it's sprinkled. And when the insect comes in contact with this diatomaceous earth, it dries out the cuticle. And this ultimately kills the insect. This last image on the right here is of a nematode. So these specific nematodes, and there's many different strains of nematodes, but the ones that target beetles specifically are known as entomopathogenic nematodes. And so these enter the beetle through an orifice, either through the mouth or the anus, and make their way to the gut of the beetle. And they feed as parasites on the gut of the beetle and ultimately kill it. Now, I'd like to discuss the advantages and disadvantages of using chemical agents, and then also discuss what the organic agent that I was researching, the advantages of that, and put these all up against one another. So the advantages of using pre-existing chemical treatments are that they show very fast results and are also highly effective. However, there are many disadvantages associated with these chemical agents. The first of which being that they can become very, very unaffordable, especially at a large commercial scale. The second is that they pose risk of soil, water, and environmental contamination. Uh, specifically in water, comophos has shown a half-life of up to 30 days without light, and in soil, it's up to a year. So these residuals remain in the environment for a quite extended period of time. And this also poses risks to wildlife, aquatic life, and the honeybees themselves. Moreover, there have been residuals shown in hive products such as honey, wax, propolis, royal jelly, comb. And so these are things that are ultimately used by humans in industries such as uh, beauty and pharmaceuticals. 
So we're ultimately putting these things in our bodies or onto our bodies. Now, the organic treatment agent that I would uh, that I was researching and that I want to discuss is affordable and sustainable. It was shown to be efficacious for small high beetle capture, environmentally friendly, naturally biodegradable, and it also showed no risk to wildlife, aquatic organisms, honeybees, or humans themselves. So my research can be broken down uh, into really two main phases. And so I'd like to focus on the first phase here. Now, the first phase was where I tested seven organic and inexpensive small hive beetle treatments. And so this first phase was looking at seven organic agents in particular, apple cider vinegar, mango puree with boric acid, cantaloupe puree with boric acid. And so these both had a 2% concentration, yeast, peanut oil, grapeseed oil, and beer. So you may be wondering why these specific seven agents were chosen, but uh, they were actually very, uh, they were chosen for a specific purpose. All of these compounds you may notice are odorous. So they're very smelly. And the literature has shown that this specific beetle belongs to a order known as Coleoptera of uh, Nidodulidae. And so these can all, these beetles can all fundamentally feed and reproduce on tree sap, rotting fruits and such odorous compounds. And that's why these specific agents were chosen. How they were implemented into the study was using these beetle blaster traps. So these agents are filled about halfway in each of these traps, which is about 10 milliliters or 12 milliliters of solution. And so once these agents are placed inside, the beetles from inside the hive will enter through the slits on the top of these traps and then die in the solution. So all of these black specks you see on the bottom right are actually beetles that have been trapped. And this is cantaloupe puree. These are some images from my research that I'd like to share with you. Uh, this image on the left is of me in a beekeeping suit. And you might be thinking, what a responsible young beekeeper with all of his protective equipment, right? That's completely incorrect. I was stung dozens of times in the field. I actually lost count. It was a very painful experience for me. I did come to learn a lot from that, but that was something I will not forget. And that really showed me the hardships of beekeeping. This second image here is of me counting beetles in my mother's kitchen. So this, is, this project was drawn in 2020 during the pandemic. And so I didn't have access to a laboratory and I had to revert to my mother's kitchen. She wasn't all that fond of this idea, but I remember these beetles can fly by the way for miles on end sometimes. I remember my brother and I would have to take fish nets in hand and chase them through the house trying to catch these beetles. So we still may have beetles in our house to this day. We'll never know. That's image on the bottom right is of these beetles captured in a beetle blaster trap. And this is specifically beer. So as you can see, they've drowned in this solution. Now, each week what I would do uh, is I would place these traps inside the hives and then I would e extract them after each week. And so this was done for a six week period and there was a total of 24 honeybee colonies used. So this was a very extensive field trial and roughly 300 data points were gathered throughout the six week uh, research period. Now, this data was statistically analyzed. I don't want to dive too much into this, but basically what's important here uh, for this chart on the left is that apple cider vinegar, which was the control of this study, it's the common treatment that beekeepers use, was being compared against the other agents. <clears throat> so apple cider vinegar was being compared against mango mix, apple cider was compared against cantaloupe, apple cider was compared against yeast, and so on and so forth. What's important is that since each of these agents are being compared, this test is basically telling us if apple cider was better or the other agent was better throughout the course of the six week period. And these columns that have the orange arrows were actually the treatments that were better than apple cider. So mango mix was shown to be better than apple cider. Cantaloupe was shown to be better than apple cider. Yeast was shown to be better than apple cider. And beer was also shown to be better than apple cider. But ultimately the goal was to figure out which specific treatment, which singular treatment was the best out of all of the agents. And so another series of statistical tests was run and it was found that beer was the best treatment by far. Now looking at this graphically, we can see here that beer is in dark blue. It has a total beetle capture of 198 throughout the course of this six week period. Uh, apple cider is in this blue color here, has 11 beetles. Something interesting to note here, besides these bars, which show the raw beetle capture, is something called the 80-20 rule or the Pareto principle. So this Pareto principle states 
And then if you start at this 80% mark here and then trace horizontally and then draw down vertically at this orange line. So uh, it divides the data into two segments here on the left and then here on the right. <clears throat> but the interesting thing is that this rule states that the data on the left here, everything in this circle, 20% of whatever is in that circle accounts for 80% of all of the beetles captured throughout the course of this study. So I'd like to reiterate that. 20% of what is in this circle, 20% of these beetles captured for these three treatments account for 80% of everything. So that really goes to show the significance of beer in particular throughout the course of this six week study. Now this box and whisker plot shows something neat. This X you can see in the circle is the mean. And so this is for beer. This mean compared to the other treatments, which you can see is, so the mean for beer is much higher than any of the other treatments. And so this shows that the consistency of the beetle capture throughout the course of this six week study was higher for beer than the other agents. And so ultimately what I concluded from phase one was that beer was 33 times more effective in its beetle capture than apple cider vinegar. And it was the best treatment by a far margin. So beer costs nearly five cents per hive on average. And it's also widely and readily available. Moreover, beer does not harm the bees and uh, only the beetles. So you won't have any drunk bees using this. The beetle blaster trap is placed in between the frames in the middle of these. And so generally uh, it's advised, at least this is what I did in my research, one trap was placed inside each super. And so this was done for the first super and then the second super. If you didn't believe me uh, on how much cheaper the beer actually is than apple cider, I have a quick cost comparison here from walmart.com. So the beer that I used was Miller High Life. And so this is 7.3 cents per fluid ounce compared to apple cider vinegar, which is 20 cents. So this Miller High Life beer, was shown to be 33 times more effective than apple cider and also a third of the cost. So it's better both economically and looking at this uh, efficacy. Now, the second phase of this research was looking at developing a blend based on beer's chemical composition. So the goal of this second year was essentially to create a refinement of beer in the form of a concentrated chemical solution. So as you may know, beer is 90 to 95% water. And so it's very diluted. And the goal here was just to concentrate that solution to make it more affordable or to make it more attractive. And there were two goals of this study. The first of which was to make this beer blend even cheaper than beer itself. And the second of which was to make this beer blend even more effective than beer. And so I know we are short on time, so I won't go too, many, uh, too much into the details with this, but basically uh, the first step in this process was extracting the chemicals from the beer. And so you can see this white tube that's here and it's connected to a pump, uh, a vacuum. So when this vacuum is turned on, the air from inside this beer bottle is actually pulled and then stored inside this white tube. And so this filament is known as a polymer. And so this polymer, there were, this was repeated for 15 uh, collections. So there were 15 of these polymers and they were run through this instrument in the middle here called a GCMS. And so that stands for a gas chromatography mass spectrum, which is a mouthful, uh, but GCMS is all you need to know. When that filament is put inside this GCMS, that filament is heated to a very high temperature. And then the chemicals from that filament are released and introduced into a coil. And so this coil is very long. It runs from 10 meters to 100 meters in length. Now those chemicals begin to separate based on their weight as they run through that coil. And at the end of that coil is a detector. So the lightest compounds run through that coil quicker than the heavier compounds. And then they're picked up by the detector first. So this instrument produces a reading here, which you can see on the right. This is a sample reading. And this X axis is time. So the more left we go, the earlier these compounds and each of these spikes is a compound. So these spikes on the left are picked up earlier than these spikes on the right. And so this is significant because these spikes on the left actually had a higher or a lower molecular weight. And so they're lighter. And it was these compounds that were a focus in this study because they're carried more easily in the air and thus picked up by the beetle quicker. 
Now, those specific compounds were taken and tested in something called an EAG or electroantennography. And this is basically where the antenna of these beetles are taken from under a microscope. And so this is like neurosurgery on hive beetles. So it's uh, very fun work and it can also be frustrating, but I got the hang of it after a few tries. But basically these antenna are extracted from these beetles and then placed onto a forked electrode, which you can see in this top left arrow. And this filter paper, which is this top right arrow has been dipped inside specific chemical compounds and is placed here. This filter paper is connected to a tube, which is connected to a foot pedal. So when that foot pedal is pressed, air is pushed through, it carries this chemical on the filter paper to the antenna, and then the antenna is exposed to it. So basically what you're mimicking here is you can see how the beetle is responding to a specific compound. And so that response is then picked up by the electrode and then amplified onto a personal computer where readings are generated. And then you can either see what the response is as a positive or a negative. And this is done uh, for quite a few different chemicals. And based on those responses, two blends were created, an oil blend and an oil water blend. So the oil blend, one of them, uh, on the right here, in dozens. So the oil blend was shown to be very, very significant compared to the other agents. Looking at this graphically, you can see the oil blend here in gray, which is shown to be best by the statistical analysis, has a total beetle capture of 620 throughout the course of the eight week period of this trial. So this trial was run for an eight week period with 28 honeybee colonies. So it was even larger than the first year. Again, looking at that Pareto principle, this 80% mark, we can draw a line here horizontally and then trace down vertically. And so this segment towards the left here, essentially the oil blend, some part of this oil water blend, 20% of this accounts for 80% of everything. So again, it really shows you the impact of the oil blend. And the conclusions from this phase two study were really that this oil blend treatment was extremely effective by a far margin. And the oil blend was shown to be five times more effective than beer and also half as expensive. So how can you use my findings and how? Unfortunately, the oil blend is not commercially available at this stage uh, that's still being developed, but beer is available. Beer does not harm your bees in any way, and it can be used in any in-hive trap as an attractant. So it doesn't just have to be a beetle blaster trap. It can be any in-hive trap that needs an attractant to function. Beer is very effective and it's also affordable. As I mentioned earlier, compared to apple cider vinegar, it's merely a third of the cost and it was shown to be 33 times more effective. So beer is definitely a very effective and affordable uh, small high beetle attractant. The key takeaways I'd like to share for small high beetle management are really two things. The first is having good apiary practices, having cleanliness, uh, good sunlight exposure, not exposing or not adding too many frames onto your hives uh, for honey extraction, extracting at the right time. And then the second thing is using treatment to control for small high beetles. Whether this ultimately be chemical-based treatment or organic-based treatment, it's up to you. Using these two things, it's the synergy of them that ultimately reduces small high beetle populations to a low and manageable level. These are some resources that I can definitely share after this meeting. And so these are some PDFs on small high beetle biology, and they also contain some resources on treatments. This last link is to the UF Honeybee Lab page. And so this uh, link has, this YouTube page has videos, not only for small high beetle management, but also for beekeeping just in general. So it's a very useful link that you may wanna take a look at. So that's all I have for you all today. I'm open to Q&A now. Uh, thank you for your time and attention. And so one thing I do have before I open up the Q&A uh, is if I have a request, if you all could open up your phones and maybe go to the camera app and hold it up to this QR code. Uh, this QR code just contains two questions about what you thought about my speaking uh, and the PowerPoint as well. So if you could just give some feedback, that would be very, very helpful. And I'll open to questions now. So if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them.
Actually, at this point, we're running over our time limit and have other speakers to pop on. So we might have to skip your QA session. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Whoa, sorry. Just push the button, it'll be on. Okay, can everyone hear me? 